Good morning, would you stand? Let's worship together this morning. Give God praise for all that he's done, is doing and will do. You have given us a new name as sons and daughters of your righteousness. And you have taken all that God has done and is doing and you expect him to see, see him do something greater in the future, let's sing out this, this song and tell him about all the great things that he's done.
simple phrase. Church, let's claim it together again. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable.
Good morning. You guys can go ahead and be seated. We're so glad uh, that you could uh, join with us this morning for this time of worship. Glad that you guys were able to uh, get to us through the dense fog this morning. Um, we had a brief period where we were going to put a light on top of the church so you could get here, but uh, we, for, fortunately we didn't have to do that. Um, we are especially glad um, if you are a first-time guest with us today. Um, if you have never been to First Lubbock before, I'd like to personally welcome you. Um, we would really like to get to know you a little bit better, and one of the best ways we can do that is through the First Lubbock app. Um, you can download that really quick. There's a place on there called I'm New, which is just a really brief contact form. And all we're going to do with that is we're going to reach out to you. We're going to say thank you so much for coming. Um, and we're going to give you the resources that you might need if you'd like to get plugged in with us. Um, we'd love for you to get on mission with us as we continue to worship, transform, and serve. Um, and there is a service opportunity coming up for everybody here this morning. Inside your bulletin, there is a uh, Dupree Fall Festival flyer which is, uh, we need volunteers for that. It's an event that we do every single October. Um, we do it at Dupree Elementary, and we'd really love for you guys to come uh, on mission with us, to reach out to that community, give back to that community. Um, we need people to run booths, to make cupcakes, do all sorts of different things, and you can do that either by filling out this form, you can turn it into the offering plate, or you can uh, uh, sign up for it online over at our First Lubbock, over at firstlubbock.org. Um, so we'd really appreciate that. It's a great opportunity for us to give back um, to our community, to be on mission at all times. Um, every Sunday, we do a live stream of the service, um, and you can share the live stream right now. You can go over to Facebook, um, and the reason why we ask you to share that is not because we want to make First Lubbock popular or because we want to make Bobby popular or anything like that. The reason why we want to share the live stream is because you never know who in your social media sphere of influence um, might need a message of encouragement um, or might need, need a challenging word this morning. Um, you never know who's never darkened the halls of a church before or who hasn't been in a long time. So we just encourage you um, to share this live stream. It's really easy. You can go find it on our Facebook page. Um, there's a little button in the left-hand corner called Share. Um, whenever you open that up, uh, go ahead and write, uh, write a post that is hashtag Shake It Out. Um, we really appreciate it if you would do that. Um, make sure it's Shake It Out and not Shake It Off. Shake It Off is a song by Taylor Swift. Um, shake it out is Bobby's uh, message this morning. He is adamant that he's not performing that today. So um, make sure to share the live stream. Really appreciate it. And then while you guys are sharing the live stream, you guys can go ahead, stand up, greet the people around you, greet your family this morning. All right, if you will, head back to your seats. Go ahead and have a seat. There's a custom that goes on in uh, support groups around the world. When they walk in, they introduce themselves, and they say, Hi, my name is, and then they follow it with whatever the line is. And so this morning, I wanted you to know that, Hi, my name is Ken, and I'm a sinner. I know that shocks some of you, right? Not really. <laughs> no, I know. So what I'd like to do to make sure everybody feels uncomfortable, if you would turn to somebody next to you and say, you are a sinner. Uh, we know that about Be sure you wag that finger. <laughs> All right. So, so back in the day, in order to get to God, people would set up these altars, and they would sacrifice animals on them, and they would do that through a priest. A priest was the go-between between between God and his people. And it was longing for a relationship, longing to, to get right what was wrong, longing to restore this friendship that God had created from the very beginning of time between man and people. But it didn't work very well. The sin was rampant. 
And there never seemed to be enough animals. They would do it daily. They would do it weekly. They had this one day a year called the Day of Atonement that they would set aside. And it was a real somber day where they would present all the sins of the people or the priesthood on the altar, on this animal, and burn it up. But it wasn't a lasting relationship because it was God and then this priest and people. And there was this disconnect. But Jesus came. And he laid himself on the altar. We call it a cross. And he, once and for all, was the sacrifice for your sin and mine. We don't need to do altar sacrifices anymore. In fact, the writer of the Hebrews says, don't do that anymore. Once and for all, Jesus has paid the price for our sin, our past, our present, and even our future. And yes, we still desperately need to come to him and confess because every day, I don't know about you, but every day, every moment of every day is a, is a potential sin for me. What I think, what I do, what I say. And so as I come to him, as we come to him, we confess and we tell him, look, I'm struggling here. I'm sorry I let you down here. I'm sorry I didn't do this that you wanted me to do. And instead I chose this. And the good news is because of Jesus, we don't go through a priest. We don't go through anybody. We go straight to God who has his arms open wide as we come to that altar. So as we learn a brand new song together that will give us words to say, we confess. Let's do that today. Let's don't just listen to a song or just sing through. Let's confess. Let's get it out. And know that as we come to this altar, he's got his arms open wide to hug on us, to love on us, to forgive us, to set us free. Because Jesus has paid the price for your sin and mine. And then he says, don't just hoard that. Share it with everybody. As Bobby talks about all the time, wherever your feet hit the ground, share the story of what he's done in our lives. So let's pause and spend some time getting it out as we experience the forgiveness that Christ paid for with his life.
Thank you, guys. We continue our series on uh, countercultural uh, discipleship and what that looks like. We understand as Christians we are a countercultural people, but uh, what is oftentimes lost in uh, the church culture is that we really are a counter-religion kind of, of people. And so we're, we're concerned about what Jesus said to his disciples. Uh, and so we are looking at the Sermon on the Mount in its entirety, which is probably the most intensive teaching of Jesus during his earthly ministry, uh, probably his uh, most intensive uh, direct teaching to his uh, disciples. We began with the Beatitudes the past uh, three or four weeks, and now we transition to very, to very key statements that Jesus makes here in uh, verses 13 and 14 of Matthew uh, chapter 5. These are the you are statements. And these are significant because Jesus gives to us, his people, his disciples, his followers, our identity. And so whenever you hear Jesus say, you are the salt of the earth, when you hear Jesus saying, you are the light of the world, which we will entertain next week, what it should do is to force you to reimagine your life. Reimagine what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. If you really understand your identity as, as the people of God, it forces you, forces me to reimagine my role in the redemptive purposes of God as an agent being used by God as his ambassador 
and how that looks and how that is to perform and live in the world in which we find ourselves today. Now, leading into these you are statements, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world, uh, those, those two statements presuppose some things. You shouldn't be surprised that it's based upon what has already been said in the preceding verses, in the Beatitudes. When Jesus says that you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world, it presupposes that you have done the very thing that Jesus spoke to in verse 3, that you have declared your spiritual poverty, that you have, have declared your spiritual bankruptcy, that you really have nothing to present to God. There's nothing that you could point to and say, this is why I am deserving of salvation and eternal life. He's really speaking to the new birth being born again, becoming a new creation in, in Christ Jesus. And those who do that, who declare their bankruptcy, spiritual bankruptcy before God, these are people that are comforted by his spirit. It has to do with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as we see there in, in verse 4. And these are the ones who have, who have been set on the path that are moving towards eternal life, who shall inherit the earth, Jesus says there in, in verse 5. So as Jesus makes these you are statements, it presupposes that you're chasing the life that is being described in the Beatitudes, that you're someone that is chasing after these things. This is what identifies you and defines you. You're a person that is being blessed by God, that is fortunate, happy, fulfilled, and rich, purposed in your life because these are the things you're chasing after. Verses 13 and 14 presuppose that. They can't just be taken alone in isolation. And so as this morning we hear Jesus make this statement, you are the salt of the earth, a statement of identity. We really need to get our minds around this as, as the church. Because really it's a communal identity that Jesus is giving to us. You are the salt of the earth. He's saying that you're a communal people. You are a, a community of, of faith. You are, you are the body of Christ. You are the church. You are the salt of the earth. You, it's plural in, in the Greek. You, collectively. Not any one of us in, in isolation, but all of us collectively. He's saying you, plural, you are the salt of the earth. All the functions and responsibility of the old Israel have been transferred to you. That's what you are means. It means you are the new Israel that has, that has now embraced the responsibility and the functions of the old Israel. It's you collectively. You're my people. You are the salt of the earth. You are a people of influence. See, when Jesus uses that plural, you are, you are the salt of the earth, really what, and don't miss this, he's really speaking to a very high view of the church, a very high view and opinion of how important it is that we see ourselves as part of a, a collective group, not a lone ranger mentality that says, I don't need the church. That's foreign to what Jesus is saying here. This whole idea of a lone ranger kind of faith is so far removed from the teaching of Scripture. So it's a very high view of, of church that Jesus is introducing here. You're the salt of the earth as you understand that you're a people of community. This is how you have influence out in the world as the body of Christ. That's why you hear me say so often and you will always hear me beating this drum. This is why it's so important that we each one as members of the body, the body of Christ, it's, it's so important and imperative that if the mission of Christ, the Great Commission, is to be fulfilled in this world, it's only going to happen as every member of the body of Christ is committed to being the presence of Christ, of being the church, where you are standing, being where your feet are. Now you say, well, Bobby, that's, there's nothing really novel about that. No, I think it's pretty novel. Because for whatever reason, the church has had through the years the idea that, that, that to be a missional people, that to talk about missions is to talk about somebody else somewhere else. When in fact, missions in the Great Commission isn't about someone else somewhere else. It's about you. It's about me where we are, where we're standing. I mean, can you imagine 
the effect that that would have in our world if every professing believer and follower of Christ understood that missions is about where you're standing. It's about being and understanding that you're the presence of Christ at school, at work, that it's not when you're in here. Can you imagine the influence and the impact that that would have on the world if we could get away from this mindset that missions is something done by someone else, somewhere else, but it's my responsibility where I am? Think of the impact that would have. The part of the problem is through, through the history of the church and especially in the, in the evangelical tradition, one of the things I noticed as a college student when I became a Christian and first entered into the life of community, the church, and this is, this is the early 80s, and I recognize churches are having these big events having these, these events, and, and they'll, they'll talk about it at these events. They'll celebrate afterwards and say, well, you know, there were, there were 500 people saved at this event. A thousand people were saved at this event. We got them all registered. We, were all, we wrote down all their names. And I would, and I would think, and as a, as a 21-year-old new convert and studying Scripture, I thought, you know, a thousand people? Becoming a new creation in Christ Jesus, that, that should have some kind of impact. 500 people that, that come to an altar and say that, that they're committing their life to Jesus Christ, you would think that, that if, if that's legitimate new birth, man, that's not just going to change this church. That, that kind of stuff changes communities. But nothing ever changed. You know, when I came here 16 years ago as a pastor in August of 02, staff had already planned a calendar event, calendar planning retreat. And so we, we hold up for a couple of days and making out this calendar. And this is in September. And somebody says, oh, we're remembering the spring. We've got to put this thing back on the calendar for the next year, this event that apparently they had had in the spring. And they, they said, we've got to do this again. It was such a great success. 175 people were saved. Let's put it on the calendar. I said, now, how many of those were actually baptized? And they all got this kind of distant stare in their face, and they said, uh, I, think, I think one. Really, 175 saved? Got one baptized? Well, did y'all follow up on the rest of them and, and see if they're, they're being planted in a church somewhere and actually being, being discipled? Yeah, no, no, no. I said, well, before we put that on a calendar, I said, why don't, we, why don't you present to me a follow-up plan? When you give me a follow-up plan, then we'll put it on the calendar. Never happened. And the tragedy and the indictment against us in this mentality of the church in the past 30 or 40 years where we, where we became keepers of the aquarium instead of fishers of men is in having all these big events and fooling ourselves into thinking that, that salvation was being accomplished in people's lives, the tragic reality is, is probably what was done. And there were some success stories, sure. I'm not taking away from that, where it was real, or where it was genuine, where it continues to this day. But I'm saying for the most part, all that the church really did was to give those vast number of people that came to the altars was they gave them an inoculation of the dead virus of religion. And because they were given a dose of that dead virus of religion, it inoculated them from ever experiencing any real kind of faith. Because if that had been real, it would have been transformational. If it had been real, it would still be true to this day and it would continue on to the future. You see, what, what Jesus is seeking to accomplish, the mission that is ours, it can't be measured by some corporate model. It can't be measured by notches on a gun. It can't be measured and counted on a stack of cards that are filled out by individuals rushing to an altar. Listen, if you truly embrace the biblical teaching of being where your feet are, being the presence of Christ, being on mission wherever your assignment is in life, 
if every one of us embrace that, I think that we will be on the day of God's judgment, I think we'll, we will be absolutely amazed and astonished when the layers of eternity are peeled back and we see all the people's lives that were touched. Not because we dragged them to an event and got them to fill out a card, but because you and I collectively, communally, as a people of God, were committed to being the presence of Christ at school. And somehow God used you as a link in that chain, eventually bringing that person to faith. And it's not something that can be counted, but when eternity is peeled back, you will be amazed at the lives that were impacted and touched because you were committed to being where your feet are. That's what happens when, you're, when you understand our communal identity as a people of God. It's also a very, a very unique thing in this identity that is ours. Not only is it a communal identity, it's a confirmed identity. The definite article is emphatic. You are the salt of the earth. It's not saying you could be the salt of the earth. It's possible you could be the salt of the earth. You can be the salt of the earth. Again, this is presupposing that everything in the Beatitudes is true about you. That this is, that this is what you're chasing after in life. This is what defines you as a person. You've poured out yourself in spiritual poverty and bankruptcy. You're chasing after all these things that, that bring fullness and completeness in life. He says on the basis of that, you are the salt of the earth. Not could be, may be, might be, can be. You are. You see, that, that's, the, that's the Christian ethic. That's what separates Christian ethics from every other kind of, of world religion, every other kind of philosophical ethic. Every other philosophical ethic is based upon what you should be. Our Christian ethic is being what you are. It's settled once and for all. You are the salt of the earth. And that's what separates us. That's what distinguishes us as the people of God. That's what makes the Christian faith unique. You see, every other religion, every other philosophical approach to life is based upon what you could be. What you should be. Ours is based upon what you are. Not only does Jesus in this teaching, in making this statement, this you are statement, you are the salt of the earth. It's not only about a high view of the church, it's a high view of us. This statement, you are the salt of the earth, it is a grace-filled statement. This is what you are. This is what differentiates us from every other religion of the world. Our completeness, our wholeness, what we are is established up front. It's a gift from God up front in the journey. This is what you are. Every other religion and its award system is based upon what you should be, what you can be if you fulfill that potential. Not in the grace and the mercies of God. He establishes on the front end what you are. And by virtue of that, we're trying to shake it out. We're trying to work out our salvation because it's already been established what I am. I don't have to work for it. I don't have to labor for it and hope I can be rewarded this at the end. No, he says, this is what you are right now. I know what defines you. I know what you're chasing after. This is what you are. And it changes my understanding of how God desires to use us. So i got to be busy trying to work it out, shake it out, make real, make manifest what I, what I already am. It's a confirmed identity. But it's also in this statement, this you are statement, it's also about a contrasting identity. You are the salt of the earth. And what, what the, I guess what the soul is to man, that, that's, what, that's what salt really is, is a representation of what the soul is to the body. A salt is to the earth. You are the salt of the earth. It's very distinguishing. You being the salt of the earth means that that you have contrasting qualities in your life from the rest of the world. You have qualities and characteristics being the salt of the earth. You, ha you have qualities that separate you, that make you a very distinctive person from anyone else. 
Salt spices up food. I mean, one of the first things you recognize in food when you taste it is what? You, you recognize immediately. What do we say most often? It needs more salt. Salt has a seasoning effect. Faith ought to have a seasoning effect on life. I mean, faith ought to really spice things up. It ought to spice things up around you. People ought to, be, uh, people ought to enjoy being around you. You know, in pagan literature, the word that's translated salt is a word in, in their literature that's translated as witty. And, and, I, you know, and I, I appreciate that, and I see the importance of that, because when you think about it, how many of you really associate faith with wittiness, winsomeness, personality? In fact, when I was growing up and not going to church, the only people I knew that identified themselves as, as Christians were people that were none of those things. They weren't, they weren't witty. They had no personality. And it was certainly people I'd, I was not aspiring to be like. I mean, these people, that I, my impressions of Christians in, in high school where I really started to have some, some awareness and cognitive understanding of, of, of life around me. And then when I get into college, the only people I knew that, that really confessed to be Christians, man, they, I mean, I'm convinced they thought the original sin was laughing at a joke. I mean, they, these people, this, I mean, they look like they've been baptized in pickle juice. I and mean, they, they had their little pocket Bibles and their little self-righteous attitudes. You know, they were just trying to beat the devil out of everybody. I mean, they were, they were the against crowd. They were against anything that looked any semblance of fun. And it certainly wasn't anything that I was, I was aspiring to. Is your, faith, is your faith winsome? Is it enjoyable to be around? Faith is... Salt is also a, a preservative. Another thing that, that separates us, should separate us as, as a community of, of faith, is, is, is we, we are concerned about preserving the things of God. Those things that are good and right and holy. We have standards, morals, values that come from Scripture that, that we hold up. That we, the church, understand the church, the body of Christ. This is the locus. This is ground zero. We, the body of Christ, not the building. We, the body of Christ, the people of God, we are ground zero for God's activity in the world today. We are the advocates for those things that are good, right, and holy. Listen, don't miss that. When I'm talking about being a preservative of those things, I'm not, I'm not talking about standing up on top of a self-righteous soapbox and waving your finger and telling the world how bad it is. That's not being a preservative. That's fulfilling every stereotype that the world has of us. The church alone is responsible for the things of God, not the world. I don't know where we ever got off this, on this thing where somehow the world is responsible for Christian values. That belongs to the church. Now, now I know the basis of it. When we're not doing it, it makes it easier to start condemning everybody else for not doing it. And waving, their, waving our finger at them. Oh, I can't believe. Corporate America. Taking Christ out of Christmas. Well, maybe, maybe it was us that took Christ out of Christmas. You know, we, we loved going into the department store and seeing Merry Christmas. At least we could appease our conscience when we were running up our credit card to unprecedented indebtedness. At least I could look up there and see Christ in Christmas. Make me feel good about myself. I fear the church took Christ out of Christmas a long time before corporate America did. The things of God belong to the church. You know what Paul said to the church at Corinth? They were in a very secular culture, very worldly cult culture, and of course it made its way into the congregation. And, and Paul is rebuking them and their attitudes about some sexual immorality that's taking place. And Paul is essentially saying, you better get that taken care of before I get there. If I have to deal with it when I get there, it's not going to be pretty. And, you know, and they were trying to say, well, this is just the way it is. That's, the way, that's, that's where we live. That's our culture. Everybody's doing it. And Paul's argument is, he says, what do I have to do with judging the world? Yeah, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. That's why a Savior came. What do I have to do with judging the world? I'm concerned about you as the people of God. How are you living? You're the witness. You're the testimony. You're the preservative of, of the things that belong to God. Quit, quit pointing your finger at the world. It's you. 
Peter said, let judgment begin in the house of God, and it will. And it's because we're the ones that are accountable for the things of God, not the world. The world is the world, and it always has been, and it always will be. That's why he says we are salt. We're the influence. Another quality of salt makes people thirsty. The way you live your life, your faith, does it make people thirsty for more? Now, if you, just, if you have an accommodating kind of faith, if there's nothing that really distinguishes you, sets you apart from the crowd and the masses, listen, pe- people already have that. Are you making them thirsty for more? Is your life causing people to pause and think about about something beyond this life something bigger than themselves something that that matters it's part of our part of our identity it's a communal identity it's a confirmed identity it's a contrasting identity but very quickly it's also a continental identity that we have our our identity is very continental it's global You are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. Now that's talking about that's talking about the spread of our influence. He doesn't say that that you're the salt of Galilee, you're not the salt of Palestine. You're the salt of the earth. He's talking about our global effect, our global impact. You know, we, we have this insipid effect just, to, just as salt permeates through food. He's saying that you and I, as, as a people of God, our influence, it permeates through the earth. It permeates through the world and has an influence. And you think about the reality of this. I think sometimes we fail to see this in, in these terms. When Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth, think of those, think of those disciples to whom he was speaking. And now here we are 2,000 years later. He's saying to them, you're the salt of the earth. People who had probably never traveled 10 miles from their birthplace. But you're the salt of the earth. And here we are 2,000 years later. And the gospel is on seven con- all seven continents in the world. It's because our ministry is global. Our impact is global. In ministry. But there's a warning that has to be heeded here. You'll notice it says, after the declaration, you are the salt of the earth, and all that that means in regard to our identity, it says, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Now that word or verb, that's translated there as becomes tasteless. You know, every, every verb has a tense voice and a mood. And when Jesus makes this, this statement here, but if the salt has become tasteless, that verb is in the aorist tense. That means that it, that means that it started at some definable, some definable moment. Where, where, where you used to have a unique identity, you used to have a unique influence as a follower of Christ, as a supposed follower of Christ, but now you don't. That, that has been, been lost. It, it began at one definable moment when, when you became tasteless. Passive voice. Passive voice means, means it can happen to anyone. It can happen at at any time, there's no outside agency acting upon you. It's just, it's just passive. It just, it just happens. But the subjunctive, the subjunctive mood, and, I, and this is where I really want you to get this, the subjunctive mood of this verb is that whether or not this happens to you, your salt becoming tasteless, your supposed faith no longer defining you, whether or not that happens in your life, it's up to you. That is determined by you, you alone. You can't blame outside forces. You can't blame outside circumstances of life. 
If all of a sudden you turn from this supposed faith journey that you were on, saying, you know what, I'm not going to do that anymore. And you, don't, you no longer have this influence that you're to have as a supposed follower of Jesus Christ. That's you. It's nobody else. E.F.F. Bishop in his book, Jesus of Palestine, paints a very, I think, realistic picture of what Jesus is speaking to. In ancient Palestine, ovens were built outside. And they were uh, bricks built around a tile floor. Well, before the tile floor of these ovens was put down, they would put a layer of salt that, that really served as insulation. And after a while, what would happen is that that salt would would lose its effectiveness. And then, so they'd have to take apart the the stone oven and pull up the tile. And they would take this this salt and they would just throw it out into the street where it's trodden under the foot of men. And whether or not that's what Jesus has in mind, I'm not sure. But he's talking about the implications of your saltiness, your distinctiveness being lost. Because once your distinctiveness is, is lost, all that proves out is that what happened back here wasn't real. Because if what happened back here, when you said you were going to commit, when you said, I'm, I'm now committing my life to Christ and following after him, if that was real, if that was genuine, it will continue. It will have a present tense reality in your life and it will have a future consummation. Scripture in New Testament knows nothing, nothing about this idea that I was saved back here, but it has no impact upon my life. That's, some, that's somehow, I don't know how it happened, and I apologize, but that is some man-made creation that has no biblical merit whatsoever. Because if that was real, it's real today, and it'll be real tomorrow. Don't be one of those who say, well, you know, I'm just going to wait, wait till the end, see how it shakes out. Doesn't work like that. You better shake it out now. Got to keep shaking it out. Got to keep, keep, keep working your salvation out. That's what Paul means. Peter means work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Let what you are become the reality that, that people see in you. That's real faith. It's real salt right there. That's the salt that makes a difference. We're all agents of influence. That's what we are. Not can be, could be, should be. That's what you are. You're an influence. That's our identity. Father, we're always challenged by the idea that we're a part of your redeeming redeeming purposes in this world. We're always moved by the idea that somehow you desire to use us that it's we the church that is now the body of Christ in this world and father what great weight that is what great privilege that is for us but we know lord this is reality only as as we begin the faith journey it's only as as we answer the call of Christ to follow him So I pray this morning that if there's someone that has never made that decision, no one that has ever made that commitment to you, that Lord, today might be day one of their faith journey. That today might be day one when they answer the call of Christ to follow him. For others, Lord, that that know you, that call themselves disciples, that, that need a church home, that Lord, they would answer the call this morning. That they would see the significance, the importance of the local body, being a part of a local community of faith. That we are not called to walk in isolation, but we are called to walk as a group, as a people, as a community. And so we give this time to you and the movement of your spirit and your bidding in our heart, in our minds. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.